Welcome back to Rewind of the Living Dead. I'm Damon Martin. And I'm Patrick Guerra. And Patrick, this week we are leading into a new film actually coming out next week called The Boogeyman, which is also based upon a short story by the great Stephen King. And so we figured what better way to get geared up for a new summer release than to review another classic film based on a Stephen King novel, the first ever Stephen King novel, the great film Carrie. Carrie, here we go, Carrie. And, you know, this podcast is no stranger to Stephen King and his movies. We've uh, done, we've done uh, The Shining, we've done Dr. Sleep, we've done Silver Bullet, uh, probably some others. I'm not sure. I feel like we have. Uh, we, we had this conversation last week when we were trying to pick out a Stephen King movie, and I was like, I don't think we've reviewed a lot of them. And then I was like, actually, we reviewed like six of them. So Yeah, more than uh, more than most movies. We, we review Stephen King movies on here. Yeah. Um, but hard, that's cool. It's hard, avo- it's hard to avoid, you know, considering who Stephen King is, you know, so. Yeah, like super prolific. It must be cool to be, <laughs> I say it must be cool to be Stephen King, but just the idea of, uh, so much of your horror is out there in the world and is is consumable on many levels obviously you know he's got his rabid fan base in literature which i know you've read pretty much everything stephen king has written um and then there's movies and then there's all the influence there's television as well he's just like he's this I don't know. He's like he's like the the cordyceps in The Last of Us. Like he just has spread everywhere, and he is in everything. And it must be cool to kind of sit back and know that and go, yeah, all the fucked up ideas I've ever had in my head um, are now out there in the world, and everybody knows them, and everybody knows Carrie, whether you're from that era or not. And uh, I tried desperately to get my sister to um, to text me back before the show because she grew up. Like she was of, of like the perfect age to go to like a drive-in and watch Carrie when this movie came out, but I didn't get her before the show. Um, but it must have been something to see a movie like this come out in 1976, it was, I believe. Yeah, 1976. Yeah, 1976 and and just how absolutely insane this movie gets. It, it's kind of insane all the way through. Um, but yeah, Stephen King's very first adapted film. And I'm assuming your you you've read carry uh the 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 book i actually have not read carry the book that's really a few i have not yeah that's actually one of the few i have not i've re- i mean there's a, let me let me say when i say a few there's a lot of stephen king novels i haven't re- read but i've read most of the famous ones that have been adapted into television and or films but that's one i actually haven't um so i wasn't as i i here's the thing with carry i was super familiar with the film growing up so I never got around to reading the book. Like this sure. was one that I grew up with. This was out before I was born. Uh, and I just heard about it growing up. So this was one of the ones along with Silver Bullet. Actually, funny enough, funny story about that. We reviewed Silver Bullet. And I actually had just reread the short story. It's based upon like last year, the novella. It's based upon last year because it had been forever. Um, Silver Bullet is well documented. One of my favorite werewolf films and one of my favorite Stephen King adaptations. So yeah, Carrie's one I never actually read. Um, it was, I actually, I didn't, I mean, I knew it, but I kind of forgot it. But when I was doing research to get ready for the podcast today, I remember once again that this was his first ever published novel. Like I had kind of forgotten about that. And Talk about making your <laughs> time to hit the ground running in a career. You release Carrie in 1974. By 1976, it's a film, and then you look at the huge bibliography of Stephen King of all the things he's had adapted into film and television shows since then. But talk about hitting the ground running. Your first debut novel immediately gets attention and gets turned into this film uh, by the great Brian De Palma, who wasn't the great Brian De Palma at the time. He was still an indie kind of smaller, you know, smaller studio indie independent filmmaker. This was his first major studio film. And even that, as I mentioned in the intro, they gave him a fairly small budget by comparison to most big action thriller horror films like you know of this same era we're talking about jaws we're talking about the exorcist you know films like that uh they didn't get that kind of budget so he had to work around some constraints at that time so it's interesting to see who brian de palma became but it really in a lot of ways started with this film yeah boy i mean i think a lot (laughs) a lot a lot of us started with this film if you catch my drift i mean it's it's a coming of age movie first and foremost and i think stephen king's um, his catalog is, is littered with a lot of coming of age stories. Um, 
But this one, I'll tell you why I think Carrie is special to me. It, uh, you know, you and I both grew up in the 1980s. We were kids. We were little kids in the 1980s. When you're a little kid in the 1980s, the world isn't like neon and high tops and like, you know, uh, flat top haircuts and, and, and weird gym clothing. It's, 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 a, it's a final echo of the 1970s. It's kind of the last breath of the 1970s. My house did not look like uh, like like the next door neighbors in Christmas Vacation. Um, it looked like the house in uh, a movie like uh, Black Phone, like there wood paneling on the walls, there's shag carpet, there's a lot of brown and yellow. Like my parents, they were still like, that was probably the last time they were young and hip was the 1970s. So my house was kind of locked into the 1970s. So when I watch movies like this, movies like this, movies like Bad News Bears, um, I get like a, I get like weirdly nostalgic because it just reminds me of what life looked like when I was little, when I was a little kid. Like the best way I can kind of imagine life was this was movies like this, like this. These were hairstyles and and uh, and clothing that looked familiar to me. And so there's something about revisiting this movie uh, after many years. It's been a, it's been a while since I've really sat down and watched the whole damn thing. But just the way people talk, the way people act, the way people look, I was like, damn, this really reminds me of when I was a little, little kid. Yeah, it was. This is one of those films, as I mentioned, you know, growing up, there were certain horror films you heard about, right? Like from that era because we grew up in the 80s so we grew up when nightmare on elm street was around and friday the 13th was around and halloween was around and other you know films of that era i'm wearing a night of the creep shirt one of my favorite 80s horror films by the great fred decker who went on to write the monster squad um yes. we grew up in that era where we kind of grew up to think about films like this it was like oh have you heard of that's kind of where we heard these films Jaws was one of those films. Exorcist was one of those films. Going back into the 60s, obviously, but Rosemary's Baby was one of those films. And Carrie was one of those films. Carrie, you know, obviously we reviewed The Omen recently. That was another one that actually got some, you know, Academy Award uh, consideration. And, of course, this did as well with uh, nominations for both Sissy Spacek and, uh, and Piper Laurie. And this was kind of the film that launched Sissy Spacek's career in a lot of ways. Um and she went on to, you know, we all know she went on to do a lot of great things in her career. Um, but yeah, this is one of those films growing up in the eighties where you're like, have you heard of Carrie? Have you seen Carrie? And so that was kind of my experience with it initially with the two things, two things you heard about, have you seen Carrie? And do you know about the pig's blood? Those are the two <laughs> things like everyone knew about Carrie, but this is, this is a really stylized and, and, and haunting film in a lot of ways. Um, it definitely has Brian De Palma's handprints all over it for obvious reasons. Of course, it's his film, but he had a certain style in that late seventies, early eighties period where he made films like this. And, and my personal favorite Brian De Palma film, Dress to Kill, which I love that film. Um, Body Double is another one, you know, kind of an erotic thriller. I really enjoy that film. Um, the lead star in body double actually went on to become one of the lead stars. He played Dr. Neil in nightmare on Elm street part three. Um, there is actually a callback to nightmare on Elm street part three in this film. Sue's mother in Carrie goes on to become the lead doctor at the, uh, psychiatric facility in nightmare on Elm street part three. Oh, sure. uh, lots of, lots of connections in, in horror history, uh, with these, with, with Carrie, Carrie is, a you know, launched a lot of careers. William Catt, who, who of course plays the lead Tommy Ross, he goes on to become the greatest American hero. One of my <laughs> favorite shows in the eighties when I was growing up, um, of course, John Travolta. And of course, Nancy Allen, who went on to star in dress to kill and actually got married to Brian De Palma. So this film has a lot of roots in what would become horror in years later and actually launched a lot of careers. Um, and is of course iconic. I mean, anyone who knows anyone who is involved in horror should know Carrie. This is one of those films where it's like, if you haven't seen it, you have to see it. And if you have seen it, you like to talk about it. Yeah. You need to like revisit it every now and then. And, and again, for, for me, 
um, it's it's sort of an anthropological uh, dive into into my childhood and even the childhood of my older siblings. I have three older siblings um, who were all very, very, very much influenced by this because you figure uh, they were all born in the late or the mid to late 60s. And so this was something a big deal to them in the in the 70s. So everything that they did, all the horror references that they made came from movies like this, came from Carrie. I don't know how many times I heard in my house, they're all going to laugh at you. They're all going to laugh at you. Like I heard it all the time coming from the the three older siblings who are much older than me. Um, and then my sister, who was the oldest, would like you know, do things and, the, you know, to, to scare my older brothers, like hold up a knife. It was a lot of fun at my house, by the way. Um, <laughs> she'd hold up like a butcher knife and, and like, and like twist it in the sunlight. She was imitating, you know, imagery from this movie. This, this is, these are the things that they pulled from and the, the horror that influenced them. So it was fun to kind of look back on all that, but I will tell you like going down memory lane with all this and thinking about all the movies from the seventies that I really loved anyway, there seems to be this common denominator and it even came up in the black phone, which we recently touched on because they won a bunch of awards, at the chainsaw awards, congrats to Cargill and, uh, and Derrickson and, and company. Um, that movie also takes place in the late 1970s. There's something about the kids of the 1970s. And Damon, I got to ask you, what the fuck was wrong with them? <laughs> like something is really, cause it's, it's not just in the movie Carrie and we'll get into what they do in Carrie. But it's like, like, was everybody eating nuclear waste or something like and I don't you know, I don't not visually. I think the people of the 1970s tend to be like strikingly beautiful, actually, like they're really beautiful, beautiful people, but they're angry as all fucking get out. And they're like and they're nasty. And it's and, you know, go OK, well, it's just a movie. I go, I don't think it's just a movie. I think it's like a reflection of what was going on at the time. I think it's like, I feel like when I watch a show like, you know, you and I both love Euphoria, it's a, it's a real, it's an extreme reflection, but it's a reflection nonetheless of li the lives of Gen Z and millennials, uh, young millennials. Um, you, you see, you, you go, yeah, that doesn't feel far off. It's, it's this fantastical version of it, but the essence is there. And so when I think about all the movies that I loved from the 1970s, Carrie is right at the top of the list of like, what was going on with kids in the 70s, Damon? Help me out here because that intro, the, the, the very, if, you, if you know anything about Carrie, you know two things. You know the prom scene and you know the intro. And the intro, the older I get, the more horrific the intro of this movie is. And if you don't know, spoiler alert, it's almost 50 years old. <laughs> um, we start in a girl's locker room. There's a lot of girls running around, rambunctious. I mean, wild. Like you, you, what you would imagine a bunch of feral boys doing out in the woods is what these girls are doing in a locker room. And there's Carrie, sweet little Carrie, and she's in the shower and she's showering herself off and she realizes that she's getting her first uh, menstruation. It's happening. The girl's reaction in the locker room is to start pelting her with tampons and, and pads and clothing and laughing at her and screaming at her. And she does not know what is happening to her because her mom has never discussed uh, a menstruation with her at all. She thinks she's like dying or internally bleeding. And these girls are torturing her, literally torturing her and taunting her. And I thought to myself, like, what in ever loving shit? Like that had to, and Stephen, Sp uh, Stephen King does say a lot of this comes from inspiration growing up. He might've witnessed things like this. I mean, going back over this recently, you said you hadn't watched it in about 20 years. Tell me that, that that intro isn't just like hauntingly nasty. It's very jarring, but it's also a reminder that kids can be very cruel. Yeah. Uh, not to get like not to get on the whole subject of bullying and things like that, but that's just the reality. And I remember this movie's about was, bullying. Yeah, I remember when I I remember when I was in school, kids were remarkably cruel to each other. Like there is a certain cruelty to that because even when you get older, like when you get older, you like there's a there's a certain filter. You know, you will say things you don't really mean and then sometimes you'll do things you don't really mean, but there's a certain a maturity in the choices you make. Even if you're an awful person, there's a certain maturity in that. Now obviously there's horrific examples to the contrary of that. But it's just a normal, you know, just a normal situation. Work. Let's just say workplace for a, for a, you know, as a as a substitution for school. When you're in a workplace, uh, you and I don't 
either one of us really work in a typical workplace, but I've worked in offices before. And yeah. you all know the politics. Like, you may not get along with someone, but typically you're not going to air your grievances in that moment. And it certainly doesn't get nasty because there's a certain decorum that you follow. Now, again, there are harsh examples to the contrary of that because there's certainly racism and sexism and all these different things that happen in office places as well. But what I'm getting at is... There's no filter for children, typically. They're just remarkably cruel to each other, and that's where a lot of these opinions and, and, and who you are as a person is formed while you're in school because the way you are around who you're around in school and kids can be remarkably cruel. And so when you watch the scene, this opening scene, it is a reminder of that cruelty. It is a reminder of that non-filter that children have in that moment, like, the character of Sue is a good example because as we go throughout the, the rest of the film, Sue is forever trying to make it up to Carrie for being in that moment. She joined in with the crowd. You know, we're all guilty of peer pressure. We all join in with the group. When one, when 10 people are mocking or laughing at someone, everyone else feels the need to jump in with them. Or you don't want to be the outsider, not with the group. I mean, that's just typical behavior of children. So Sue joins in with everyone else pelting her with tampons and pads and laughing at her and she's laying there just mortified terrified until the teacher comes in and kind of saves her realizing that carrie has no idea what's happening to her right now but the rest of the film is sue forever trying to make up for that because she actually feels guilty for laughing and joining in with the rest of the little assholes uh for lack of a better <laughs> word but that is that what i mean and when you, while i agree that like there was something just inherently angry and like off of the children that era in 1976 and we can talk about coming out of the vietnam war and all these other things that were of that era um and that is a big part of it i'd imagine is coming out of that you know these 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 kids in this high school right now 1976 are like the first generation of kids after the vietnam war where they were not being sent overseas and being drafted in the military and things like that so i imagine that's part of it there's a lot of economics at that point in that time that we could talk about. Uh, but a little contrary to what you're saying is I think kids are always assholes. Like, I'm not saying like they're all <laughs> cruel and mean and like, you know, mean spirit and evil like this, but these stories have been happening forever. That's what bullying is. And so I think it really is a smart reflection of what actually happens. And when people watch this movie, it's especially, now if you've never seen it it is very jarring because they are explicably cruel and you're like man like that's that's a product of the time when you really think about it you're like no actually it's not because you can see stories and hear about stories and schools happening today maybe not pelting them with tampons and <laughs> mocking them to that level but there is definitely a, a level of cruelty there and i think that is kids i mean you remember what it was like being a kid patrick we didn't have that filter we didn't have, like, you just, you say things you're not supposed to say, you do things you're not supposed to do, because you haven't learned that, you haven't matured yet. Now, these kids are a little different, because they're supposed to be 16, 17 years old, give or take, you know, there's juniors, which, by the way, I'm not a, um, I'm certainly not a gynecologist, Patrick, but I'm pretty sure women get their menstruation cycle before 16, 17, maybe it's a little odd to carry, you know. Oh, they, I think they bring it up, actually. Yeah, so they actually bring that up, yeah. But uh but yeah, it's it, it is just but it is a reflection of that time, but it's also a reflection of just children in general in school because kids can be cruel. I mean, yes, yes, and this is turning into a different discussion. Uh kids can be cruel because they lack a filter, you're right. And they're and and particularly you think about hormonal kids which starts somewhere uh, around eighth grade or so uh when you start becoming hormonal you start getting really really weird and and nasty and and just awful to people <laughs> because you you don't know what to do with everything that is happening with your body um but it, that's it's one thing if like that were the end of it what happened at the beginning was kind of okay they did that and now they're moving on oh no they double down yeah, they decide to double down, which is super weird. So in the in the movie, obviously, I, I, I was like, wait, do the kids even get in trouble for this? Because in some movies from the 70s, they don't. It just kind of moves on. Uh, I think about in prom night, like, you know, there's kids out there like physically harassing other kids, like sexually harassing them. And the principal's like, hey, I told you to beat it. Like they just kind of shoo them away. These kids actually did get in trouble. And that was what made them double down. Yeah, they got in trouble for what they did. 
And they decided specifically Chris played by Nancy Allen decides like, because I got in trouble for doing something horrific, like terrible, terrible to somebody, I'm going to now double down on what I do to this girl, me and my, my dunderhead boyfriend and a couple of his, his idiot friends are going to go murder some pigs, steal their blood and ruin, ruin, uh, uh, Carrie's prom night as best we can. Um, which by the way, like, uh, all right, now let's get into some plot a little bit here. You talked about Sue, Sue kind of having regret. So she decides to have her star boyfriend, Tommy take Carrie to the prom. And, uh, I think it was ill-advised. I think we can all agree that was, but like, how did that connect with Chris and Sue? Because Chris was already on the hunt to get back at Carrie. Did she know that Tommy was taking Carrie to prom? Like, how did that connect? Like, are you talking about how did, how did, how did, um, how did, Chris how did Chris, know? Chris decide, like, I'm going to dump pig's blood all over Carrie if she didn't know that Sue was planning to send, like, if Sue and Sue and Chris were not in cahoots. No, Sue and Chris were not in cahoots, but it's word of mouth just through school. They knew it was happening. Tommy tells his friends and they tell their friends and they all knew she was coming. It didn't seem clear in the movie. Yeah. They, they knew she was coming with Tommy. And then obviously Chris rigged the, uh, you know, the, the, the King and queen of the prom to put them underneath the bucket. And obviously in the book, uh, I, I haven't read the book, but I read, I was actually one thing I did before this book move before I did this podcast is I went and I tried to compare because I've heard, for the most part, Carrie is a pretty faithful adaptation of the of the King novel, which is not the case for many of King's adaptations where they make wild changes. The Shining being a great example of that, of, of Kubrick making just drastic changes, which is why it's well documented Stephen King hates that movie. Um, <laughs> this one is a pretty faithful adaptation, but I do know from the book that when the pig's blood falls on Carrie... It does, and it falls on, and, and then the bucket falls on Tommy. Now it happens in the film as well. He gets knocked out from the bucket. In the in the book, it kills him. The bucket yeah. falls and kills him. That um, was a good that, change to just knock that, him out that because leads, it and make that sense. leads to the rage of of what Carrie is doing because Tommy's a victim as much as she is. Um, so I think that's part of it because if you remember in the in the school scene when when the gym teacher basically punishes the girls for what they did to Carrie. Sue is the one girl who's just like, I'm over you, Chris. Like, I'm done. Like, right. I'm done. Like, I, I regret doing what I did, and I'm over you. And, you know, and all her friends kind of abandon her in that moment. And then she really, like, lashes out with her with her idiot boyfriend, <laughs> John Travolta, <laughs> and his friends. Uh, and that really does become, like, the typical, like, stupid high school story where the kids are just like, yeah, let's do this. Oh, it'll be funny. So, yeah, Sue's never, but I think it's just common knowledge at that point, like, you know, word of mouth. It doesn't seem like, um, it doesn't seem like Bates Hotel, which, or Bates uh, High School, I said Bates Hotel, like, it's from Psycho, uh, Bates uh, you know, Bates uh, High School is, is, like, a big place, so I feel like it's just word of mouth, you know, like, they just knew Carrie was going to be there with Tommy, and I think, you know, like, she was trying to do something nice for Carrie to make her feel included with the group or included with the kids, because she is so um so 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 excluded from everybody so ostracized from yeah. everybody because of her mother her crazy mother two things real quick before we get anything else i got one thing i want to bring up early in the film the 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 locker room scene lots of frivolity lots of nudity lots of dancing around you know all that kind of stuff and if you watch this film and you've never watched the Brian De Palma film before, go watch any of his other films from the 80s, 70s, and 80s, and you'll start to see there's certain stylized of a little bit of giallo mixed in there, a yeah. lot of body close-ups, a lot of slow motion, a lot of highly stylized filmmaking, because he does the same thing in Dress to Kill, which is my favorite De Palma film. He does the same thing in Body Double. There's this scene that you, you hear the background music, the close-ups on the woman's body, the stylized music. It's a very, very De Palma, very, mm. very De Palma style, and I love that. And uh, and it's all set. It all sets the tone for the film. The other point I want to make is when you talk about like later in the film, what these kids are doing, the cruelty of what these kids are doing. Like I genuinely believe sue actually had good intentions for what she was doing she was trying to make carrie 
feel group, part of the group because the other point I want to make here is about the mother, Margaret oh. White, Mrs. White. Talk Ooh. about unhinged and like one of the all time evil, wicked mothers of film history. Oh my God. Margaret White is off the chain. Oh, dude, how about this? <laughs> I don't want to get into this, Damon, but Margaret, Margaret White has weirdly come back round. Yeah, <laughs> like like I was watching that performance uh, played by the great Piper Laurie, and I was like, Ugh, "These people are still here, and they're and they're and they're louder than ever." <laughs> like like it's a very a very like unfortunately relatable character. Um, I grew up in a super religious house. My mom was not that extreme by any stretch, not even close. Um, but my mom's super super religious. And so you just kind of know like, okay, here we go. Like, great. Carrie's Carrie's already kind of an awkward girl and it has a, a lot to do with her upbringing. And her mom is absolutely nutsville, like completely bonkers and, and psychopathic and, and a religious zealot. Um, and I don't know if you know this in, in those times, there was no law against religious harassment. You could harass people. And basically, when we meet Margaret, she knocks on the door of, I think it's Sue's, Sue's house. Her parents, yeah, her parents. Yeah, right. and, and, and she comes in, and you think she's going to, like, confront the family. No, she comes in going, wanting to talk about the word of Jesus. She wants to get in there and get you get you uh, talking about the Bible. And right away, the mom's like, how much money do I need to give? <laughs> yeah. Because she knows that'll how, stop her. Yeah. How much can I give you to get you to stop talking about Jesus? Yeah, which is a great character building moment. Like you just learn so much about them without them having to say much. She she knows Margaret very well. She knows what this visit's all about, and she's like, "Hey, if I pay some money, we get the fuck out of here." Because Jesus Christ, like you won't you won't leave if I know I know how this goes. Like this is a shakedown essentially, and uh, it 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 actually took a while for lawmakers to come up with a laws that actually said it's illegal to just go around harassing people for being super religious this is pre that time yeah. it actually didn't take place until i think the 1980s yeah it's, and then uh, another thing uh you were talking about oh, the shower scene yeah oh. no I was, just saying, yeah, I was just saying it's kind of crazy to think about now <laughs> versus what we i mean not to say not to say that's totally gone away but it's kind of crazy when you think about that scene with margaret white going into their house and uh her level of just zealotry i mean oh my god that woman is yeah. like off her rocker yeah, i want to show some people this movie <laughs> some people need to see this movie and be like you know you don't want to really look like this do you yeah. i don't i think we all agree she's villainous right, right. she's also and she's also just real quick like just, she's also um the whole film is based around her own shame her own guilt because she talks about yes. late in the film when she got pregnant with Carrie is because she sinned with a man and she wanted him. She talked about like, he stunk a whiskey and I liked it. Right. Uh, and he got on top of me and I liked it. And then like, she feels guilty because she had sex out of wedlock. The guy left her obviously. Um, and she had a child. And so she's been forever atoning for that ultimate sin of having sex out of wedlock and then having a child out of wedlock. And so she has ingrained it in Carrie's head that sex is bad. Um, and that's why she didn't even know about what menstruation even was because her mother is so forever guilty for her own sins that she's now casted upon her own daughter and, become again completely unhinged in her in her zealotry in her religion um and it all stems from her own guilt yeah yeah she's actually one of the better developed characters like i, I was noticing that because there's a lot of um I, I mean and a lot of actually even piper laurie herself will will say this that they looked at the script and were like this is a comedy right like these characters are so very over the top that this can't be taken seriously you know like then they they had to kind of remind her like this De Palma guy is really serious about what he's doing trust his vision and 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 you'll see in the outcome like how good it is but at the time uh Mar uh Margaret White and uh and Nancy Allen who plays Chris were like they were like this is this these no one would act like this this is too much but it was a reflection of like deeper things and that, I think I think it was the character Margaret White in particular in particular was brilliantly drawn like like a really really well drawn character um but i did want to i did want to piggyback or or bounce back to the the shower scene because something really jumped out at me while i was watching it we reviewed on this show slumber party massacre which is an all-time 80s slasher classic 
and and it turned out we learned actually a lot. I would encourage people to go back and listen to that episode because I think we actually learned a lot about how Slumber Party Massacre is actually a real interesting outlier in the world of slashers. But we were puzzled at the time when we reviewed this of why on earth the shower scene was so gratuitous. <sighs> and because that movie, Slumber Party Massacre, is written by women, directed by women, and you could just go, there's this real gratuitous nudity in the very beginning of the movie that serves no purpose other to, than to show bodies naked and, and in the shower. And then I'm watching the opening of Carrie and I thought to myself, maybe this influenced the filmmakers. Maybe. I mean, I, I, it's all supposition. I don't know. I don't have the answer. But when I watch that opening shower scene, either, even though they're very different, maybe the filmmakers of Slumber Party Massacre were just trying to pay a little tribute to Carrie, which they... I would imagine any women, woman filmmaker would be highly influenced by a movie like this. To give credit where credit's due and not to defend Brian De Palma, who does tend to use a lot of, at least in these early films, use a lot of nudity in his films. I would say, thankfully, this the, the nudity and the, the shower scene in this film, while, you know, necessarily you don't necessarily need all the, you know, supposed teenage girls bouncing around in the frivolity of being nude in the locker room, but it does play a part of the story, obviously, with what happens to Carrie, because she's, you know, yes. she's so not, not confident and, and, you know, so withdrawn and so ostracized from all the other girls and then she has the moment with her with her menstruation uh that you know the funny thing is it's like um slumber party massacre which for the most part we gave a positive review for it was goofy and it was it was <laughs> clearly dated of the 80s but nothing wrong with that slumber i would agree i think slumber party massacre probably at least subconsciously even probably took a little bit from this the difference is carrie's <laughs> opening scene actually plays the i mean it, it, literally <laughs> it serves the, a you know, purpose it serves a purpose and it's the catalyst to the entire film slumber party massacre is like <laughs> hey how many nude women <laughs> shove in one shower scene at one time and have them talk about nothing and then tease there's a guy with a drill which is also a phallic symbol sure around for the rest of the movie it's just funny because I agree. I think that scene does mirror this one, except that one serves no purpose <laughs> other than let's just get a bunch of naked teenage girls together. This one actually does serve a purpose. And to yeah. that point, you really don't have any other nudity the rest of the film. I mean, there's suggestion, there's sexuality, yeah. there's, you know, there's there's a lot of that. But this is the only scene like this in Carrie. Uh, and there's like 10 more in Slumber Party Mask. We're like, how can we get these women's tops off? Uh, which, again, was a product of the 80s. Sure. We were notorious for that. That was like, you know, if you didn't have... Uh, you know, scantily clad women running around in the 80s films, and it wasn't a true slasher. Um, this film actually served a purpose, although, again, it is very gratuitous, although it serves a purpose. It is. It, it does. It does. It serves as the catalyst, actually, for the whole film. So it's I think it's actually an important scene. Uh, and there's there actually is a PG-13 version. Uh, De Palma shot a version where they were wearing bath towels or whatever so it could play on TV, um, which was smart to do because you didn't you. This is that kind of movie where you don't want it to be hampered by nudity. And, and, and it, the mood, the nudity in this movie isn't necessarily gratuitous. And all the women playing high school uh, students at the time were in their mid 20s. One was even like I think over 30 they were they were all very much like of age you know what there wasn't any shenanigans like that going on at the time yeah did you spot by the way because again I mentioned like all the connections to like films later on of course Piper Laurie is a you know had her own incredible career I mentioned William Catt I mentioned John Travolta the great Nancy Allen uh PJ Souls of course is also in this movie a lot of people will remember her from Halloween uh this was 1976 by 1978 she was the girl uh, who was doing her own nudity in Halloween. Uh, very, very famous scene. In That's that. right. I to do that. But the one I wanted to mention, I also mentioned, of course, the connection to Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Did you catch the one friend named Helen, the one with the big glasses, who was kind of like the one friend of the group? Did you did you spot her, and did you spot who that was? Is that's the uh, secretary from uh, Ferris Bueller's Day, Ferris off. Bueller's Day yeah. off? I mean, it, I, I was like, oh my god, there she is, uh, and yeah. it just. I've seen this movie multiple times and I, I recognized all the faces and I just had never seen her before. And I was like, yeah. there she is. Edie McClurg. I, I, I knew it, but I didn't know it. Like I knew she was in it, but when I saw it again, I was like, it's Ferris Bueller. <laughs> Cause I just surprised to me. I just rewatched Ferris Bueller's day off uh, like two weeks ago. It's been on cable and I caught a bit of it and that she has 
quite possibly my favorite line of that entire film when uh, Ferris's sister comes in and complains and she leaves <laughs> eating the third character goes mm -mm -mm, what a little asshole <laughs> <laughs> she says what we're all thinking yeah but mm -hmm. it's yeah that she's she's great but i spotted her i was like hey it was like it's her which is funny because ferris bueller's came, day off came out nine years later 86 or no 10 years later 86 76 86 so she graduated from being a teenager in this film 10 years later she's like uh the secretary at the school yeah, but she looks like a middle-aged like a secretary yeah. well, she school. probably was 30 and she might have been the 30 year old i can't remember yeah. who one of the one of the girls in that group was over 30. It might have been her. Uh, I I don't oh, remember. I, and so yeah. because I've seen this movie multiple times, my girlfriend has never seen it, so she had never seen. She knew the beats of the movie because again, it's one of those films. Yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned it to her. I was like, they talk about this in Scream and the famous scene when Billy, you know, reveals that he's not actually dead and he licks the blood off his hand. And he goes corn syrup same stuff they use for pig's blood and carry that's mm -hmm. a, that's that's how iconic this film yeah. is yeah. and she watched when william cat popped on as tommy ross she's just like are all these kids in their 30s and i was like yeah that was the yes. that was the time like all the kids who played john Travolta, to all of them they were like in their mid-20s late 20s <laughs> that's what you did and to be fair they continued doing that for many many years after that we are now of an era where you know most kids are within a few years of their of their age eh. but uh yeah i mean even even the boogeyman which comes out next week which is the film we're going to review next sophie thatcher who i think is like 22 or 23 who's in yellow jackets she plays a teenager in yellow jackets she plays like a 16 year old in boogeyman and she's actually like 23 so we're yeah. not past it yet we're not oh we're still doing it. it yeah we're still Every very much doing it where you know kids play teenagers when they're in their mid-20s but you know that's just filmmaking that's just how to, everybody in euphoria i think that show starts in 11th grade everybody in euphoria is 25 when the when the show started yeah. That means by season two, they were 27, 28. I mean, there's, there's just no, nothing has changed about that. Peter Parker, the great, uh, well, what's his name? Tom uh, Holland. Tom Holland, a baby faced guy. He's 30 something years old and he's playing no, like think, a, a freshman. Actually, I think he's actually in his 20s. He started, I think he when he started. started, when he started, he was like 19 or 20. And now he's like 28 because they, yeah. it takes a while to make these films, but he's still in high school in the, uh, in the, the Spider-Man films, which is hilarious. <laughs> I always, I forever and always, whenever anyone brings up older kids playing teenagers, I will forever and always bring up Luke Perry in 90210 <laughs> when I was a kid, because I remember that from when I was a kid, when 90210 was the biggest show in the world, and Luke Perry looked 35 <laughs> playing a high schooler. Uh, <laughs> late, great Luke Perry, of course, rest in peace, Luke Perry. But I always reference that because that was the funniest one to me because he 100% did not look anywhere near a teenager. No. There, was, there was kids, by the way, we were, we, were, we were laughing watching the movie last night in the prom scene. Uh, there's one dude who's in the in the line when uh tommy and carrie get announced as the king and queen and they're walking up everyone's congratulating there's one dude there who has full-on george costanza hair yeah on his pattern baldness is like all the way back to his head and he's supposed to be a teenager i was <laughs> crying laughing i was like how did that guy get past as like an extra for this room dude was 35 and had a mortgage yeah <laughs> like <laughs> playing a high schooler it was hilarious, but that's just, I guess that's just like, okay. Yeah, that's how it is. You got to do it that this way. One, that was, I think this is, and obviously, you know, when you're talking about, you know, more serious roles, you're going to have older people, but it was funny. There's a couple in this film though, where you're like, okay, slow <laughs> down. Like this guy does not pass for 17. I guess while we're, while we're on the topic, um, we're talking about the one teacher that came to uh, Carrie's aid was Miss Collins played by Betty Buckley. Betty Buckley at the time, was younger than some of the schoolgirls that she was she was schooling. She was like 25, and there were two or three girls who were 27, 28, and 30. And she was playing the teacher. Yeah. Like, and 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 I'll tell you, like it, it I was convinced that she was older than them, that like they were teenagers and that she was about 30, 32, 33 years old. No, she was younger than she was, I think she's two years younger than Chris Harginson, who played Nancy, who she's like berating and screaming at. Yeah, and, Nancy, and and being Nancy, like, listen to me, Nancy, young lady. Nancy Allen, who played Chris, you said flip by <laughs> Nancy Allen, who played Chris Hargan. Sorry, sorry. Flip, <laughs> yeah, flip that, reverse it. But yeah, uh, Nancy Allen was, I think, two years older. If I'm not mistaken, I could have that trivia wrong. But Betty Buckley, who played Miss Collins, 
and Nancy Allen, who plays Chris, like they're, you know, they're having this teacher student relationship. Meanwhile, I, I think I'm pretty sure Nancy was older. Yeah. Which is funny. <laughs> Which is, but again, that gives you, because in that moment, even though you look at Betty Buckley in that role, like she doesn't look older, but she's in an authoritative role. She's in an authoritarian role. So you don't, you do. She's I mature. Know, it versus, works. Yeah. I mean, it does work. Yeah, it totally right? works. It, it does. The way they did it does work. So um let's get into categories for this movie patrick because there's a lot to get to with carrie um so much i want to talk about with categories because this is just again very iconic film so let's kick things off as we do each and every week here on the show and talk about best performance uh no shortage here i gotta be honest like i yeah. said this is this is a very 70s movie so there's a lot of kind of over the top you know performances but that's of the time like i judge it of the time um so I have a feeling where we're going here, Patrick. What is your best performance in Carrie? My best performance uh, was t just too dang obvious. It, it had to be Sissy Spacek as Carrie, and not just because Sissy Spacek once touched my shoulder, and then that was amazing, and then I decided to never wash that shoulder again. <laughs> um, no, a Sissy Spacek came with such an, an incredible amount of authenticity and I think I feel like that's kind of a newer buzzword in the last 10 years, authenticity, be your authentic self and da 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 da. Um, it it really shows in this film. Um, Carrie is a troubled girl who has a has a very strange mother who raised her in a very strange way. She's ostracized. She's different. And her whole life is sort of stunted, even physically stunted because of uh, what she's gone through in, in at home. And um, and Sissy Spacek puts it on screen in a way that I just I was so blown away by. And it's no it's no surprise that she got an Oscar nomination at the time. Hey, they used to they used to do that. They used to nominate horror films for Oscars. They used to do it. Um, it's an amazing performance. And, I, uh, you know, my my wife's a school teacher, so I, I meet a lot of kids that uh, and she's had a, a many age ranges that she's worked with over the years. And I've seen kids like this. And Stephen King said, yeah, this she's a carries a composite character of kids I went to school with. And it just shows in the performance. And, and Sissy Spacek was very much in a method form of acting at the time. She ostracized herself from the crew. She stayed away from them. Uh, she, she wanted to be completely in that headspace the entire time. It really shows on screen. I think it's one of the one of the better performances in horror, one of those performances that you just there's a reason why we're still talking about Carrie all these years on. It's it is because of Sissy Spacek's performance. It definitely is. There were a lot of people up for this role. I'm sure you've read the stories. Mm -hmm. We've all read the stories. Um, what we have to remember about Sissy Spacek, and I'm going to give my best performance to somebody else just so we can talk about another performance. But what you have to remember about Sissy Spacek is is she's still very early in her career at this point. Her husband. I believe his name is Jack Fisk. He worked with her to get her ready for this role. She was auditioning, and it was down to her and a few other girls. And Jack, who ended up being an art director in this film, and him and Sissy Spacek are still married to this day, by the way. Uh, all these years later, they were married in the 70s. And on her final audition, he talked her into, I believe, basically washing her face, not putting any makeup on, putting Vaseline in her hair to make it all straight and kind of dangly and kind of make her look, I won't say sickly, but very like, you know, very sheltered, you know, very like, you know, kind of strange. And she walked into the audition. Again, these are the stories of Hollywood lore. How much is true? We don't know. But she walked in as the final audition and allegedly Brian De Palma took one look at her and said, you got it because she sold it with that role. She went with that role, and that was partially due to her and her husband working together to get her ready for the part. Um, she's brilliant in this film, Patrick. I mean, yeah. and here's what I want to say about that. She was very early in her career. This is John Travolta's first film. We know what John Travolta would go on to become. Um, Nancy Allen, who was an icon of the late 70s and early 80s. Of course, a lot of people know her from RoboCop, but she had a very, very big career. PJ Souls, I mentioned, went on to do Halloween. Very iconic horror actor. Um, a lot of people, William Catt, I mentioned, went on. Like, there's a lot, of, but a lot of people in this film, most everybody in this film, this is like their first film, right? We talk about this all the time. When you are able to stack your cast with A-plus talent, 
you raise the bar. Now, what's brilliant about Carrie is none of these actors who go on to have careers were that at this point. Brian De Palma largely discovered, for lack of a better word, many of these people and put them in their first major motion picture. So it's kind of crazy when you think about, man, Brian De Palma had it so good because he had Sissy Spacek, an iconic actress in this lead role. But guess what, Patrick? She wasn't that at this Nobody point. knew her. Nobody knew her. So, to th- again, that kind of speaks to, like, the Jamie Lee Curtis and Halloween thing. Like, that she wasn't Jamie Lee. This, that was what made her Jamie Lee Curtis. Right. This is what made her Sissy Spacek. And so, while we can look back and say, man, look at all the talent in this film. They weren't that in 1976. So, it's kind of remarkable the performance that you got out of a Sissy Spacek and how good she was. Because she wasn't the iconic actress who would go on and do, you know, Coal Miner's Daughter and all the other iconic roles she's done and win award after award. This was kind of her launching point. So it's kind of crazy when you think about, man, he had it so good. That's a credit to Brian De Palma and the casting director who really you know, sought out the best people for this film. Um, for me, Patrick, obviously the answer is Sissy Spacek. Let's not kid ourselves. She sells she's this role in every, every way, shape, and form. She is meek. She is timid. She is terrified. You feel bad for her at moments. And then when she lashes out in that moment in the prom, oh my God, you better run the fuck away. <laughs> Carrie is coming for you. So she's brilliant, obviously. But for my best performance, just to give a little nod to somebody else in the cast, I went with Nancy Allen, mm-hmm. who played Chris who was a true bully and a true asshole in this film. She was the antithesis of a head cheerleader, you know, Heather. For lack of it, look at Heathers, the movie Heathers, which is another great film. The Heathers in that film, they, you talk about basing a character upon it, don't tell me there's not shades of Chris in all those Heather characters. Oh, yeah. Minus Winona Ryder in that movie. She is... The head of her friend group, she's the one they all look towards in terms of attitude and behavior. And, you know, she's uh, just filled with confidence, but also, you know, very like uh, she's got her own weakness in this film, which I think is interesting. Like you can see like how quickly she caves and abandons the way she's doing things because of her friends not coming along with her. There's a great scene in the gym where she's all on her own and you see her crumble when the people don't follow her like lemmings over the over the ledge um she's really smart and and it's easy to hate her in this movie like she does it in such a way and she's such a good bully and such a i mean again i don't know a better way to say such an asshole yeah that like you see her and you're just like i hate her Mm -hmm. i legitimately hate her and it's largely due to Nancy Allen's performance because there is a there there are other actors who probably could have done this role who would have played it differently and it would have come off as cartoonish or it would have come off as just truly like she's obviously mean spirited there's no doubt about that but she does it in such a way where you're just kind of like she's also got a certain charisma to her you oh know, yeah there's a certain charisma to her character where you can see why she's so popular you can see why the other kids follow her you can see why you know she's got this 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 uh this swagger about her mm-hmm. but she's also just inherently cruel and evil and and bullying and boy does she get what she deserves in the end <laughs> she does uh yeah she's like a rotten little brat like she really is. She's just she cannot fathom why she's being punished for what she did, which was horrific, by the way. What she did was so much worse than the pun- punishment she got was she had to she had to work out a little extra. You know, what I, it's like that, that was basically her punishment. And, uh, and the way she just sort of bites back against that and sort of very stupidly, very, very childish in, in a very childish manner, like doubles down on who she is. She's like, I'm just going to go all the way in on this. It's a very childish way to react. And remember, mind you, she's in her twenties at this point. She's not, she's not actually a child anymore. And, and I, like I said earlier, she, she interpreted the script as almost being comedic, the character being comedically bad. She was like, it doesn't even make sense, like how bad she's being, but she was able to channel it and kind of process it and put it out in a way that made sense with no no type of backstory. We don't go home and find out 
that um, the character of Chris has, you know, terrible parents who beat her. And that's why she's like that. She carries all of her bad decisions and her bad ideas with her, like through the movie without any help from any backstory. She creates it all right in front of you. Um, So it is one of those performances. It does stand out. I think people would probably assume you'd pick the mother as like the great villain of the movie. It is Chris to me you know, the, the mother is a tragedy. It's a tragedy that's happened to the mother and, and her reaction to all of it. Chris is just an absolute villain in this movie. And it's, and it's, it's due to that incredible performance. Yeah. Make no mistake. Margaret white is evil as well. She's wicked and she is everything. But again, um, I do like also, you mentioned like, you know, that like you could see Chris's home life and wonder what her parents are like and things like that. I kind of like that. They didn't really explore that a whole lot. The only parents you meet in this movie besides Carrie's mother are are Sue's parents. You meet her mother early in the film and you kind of revisit them later in the film. But we just, and she's, but the great thing about it is, is even though Chris is a bully, she's, she's obviously evil. um, She's the classic villain, high school villain character. She's not a one note character either. Like she's not just, you know, she's not twisting her mustache evil. There is, there are levels to that. And I think there, I think that part, I think a big part of that, the reason why we see that and it comes out in the dialogue in the character is because of Nancy Allen's performance. Definitely. Uh, now on the other end of the spectrum, Patrick is (laughs) the one testicle award, which we give out every, every so often, um, on this show. And, you know, we don't always celebrate it, but we do celebrate it from time to time. And it is one testicle. Named after the great Nick Cage from Prisoners of the Ghost Land, where he just goes a little over the top when he talks about his one testicle. Um, so we occasionally will give out our one testicle award. So, Patrick, when you look at Carrie, who gets the one testicle award? <laughs> Listen, movies from the 70s and 80s are always ripe for a one testicle award. I knew it was coming. And this time it came from a very, very, very famous actor. None other than the great John Travolta, who plays uh, Billy. <laughs> There's a great scene in this movie, which I, I still find hard to like understand why the scene happens, where it's, it's, it's Billy and Chris driving around in his car at night, you know, raising havoc, I guess, to just show that they're little shits. Um, boy, oh boy. You know, now John Travolta at the time, he was on Welcome Back, Cotter. That's how he got this role. Um, he, I think he was doing the first season of, uh, of it or something like that, which was, it was a high school show about a, you know, a teacher and a, and a ragtag group of kids. And he, you know, he played one of the, uh, I forget what, there's like name for his gang or whatever. I don't remember the name of it. I didn't really watch the show, but I anyway, remember, I do remember the theme song. Welcome back. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> and I remember, you know, up, you know, who the rubber hose. Like that's what, that's what John Travolta would say on the show. That's what, yeah. that's a. That's the bulk of my knowledge for the, for welcome back Cotter. But, uh, you know, he was still finding himself as an actor (laughs) and just in this movie, man, that was a great Travolta impression. I think we have to change best performance to Patrick for this one, because that was, I'll take it. (laughs) It's just, it's just something I've always, you know, it's always been spinning around in my head, but yeah, I, what hadn't been spinning around in my head was how woof, this performance was i was like oh geez okay de palma tell him to dial it back on the next take (laughs) like it's a little it's just a little over the top it was an odd scene anyway but but then like the few scenes that he's in after that it's like oh yeah he's still he's still finding his way as an actor and he and he was playing a little too nutty as the role of billy he really did not like being called a stupid shit either he really did not (laughs) like that at all and yeah this is It's so crazy because, like, we talk about of the times, like, you talk about, like, things that would not happen in 2023, Um, like, him just, like, flat out smacking Chris, like, five times this movie, he just slaps her and basically beats up his girlfriend, you're like, Jesus, and, like, there's a, there's a famous skit, like, when you listen to comedy skits, which I love old comedy, I grew up on Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor, I loved old stand-up comedy, um, when you listen to some of those bits now, you're like, Ooh, this is just not good. Yeah, there's a, they don't there's age a, well. There's a bit that Eddie Murphy does in his very famous comedy act, uh, delirious from like 81 or 82, like his big breakout, uh, standup role where it literally, the, literally the bit opens with, remember when you could beat up a woman and he does a <laughs> whole bit about like domestic violence, like, but of that time 
it was funny. Like people found it like humorous, you know what I mean? And like, I, you, like I was just like, when you listen to it now, you're like, ooh. And obviously, comedians, you know, when they when they grow up, they get older, and they look back, they're like, yeah, it was a regrettable decision to do that particular <laughs> joke. And and comedy, by and large, does does serve as an outlier because they get away with more, and rightfully so. It is comedy. It is meant to make right. you laugh. Like people freak out a little bit too much about that kind of stuff like it is meant to be uncomfortable and also be funny at the same time uh i love george carlin he said many uncomfortable things i loved richard Pryor. said many uncomfortable things and it was hilarious but that was a bit i remember that bit in my head where that was literally eddie murphy said remember when you could beat up a woman and it, re- it struck in my head because this film because there's like five times where yeah. Beth just backhands chris and i'm just like oh jesus and like, it wasn't really a problem like she didn't care that like she knew she was talking you know she was taunting him and when he retaliated with smacking her, she just kind of accepted it. It wasn't even like an issue. It didn't make her feel uncomfortable. It was their weird relationship. Yeah, it happened numerous times. I was like, yeah, many times. And you're like, jeez. Hey, like, that was one of those things where, again, I've seen this film, but I remembered it this time where I was like, oh, my God. Like, he just like slaps her around. Yeah, I don't um, remember this part of the movie at all. Yeah, I don't remember. I blocked that out. Um, my one test school award... And I, let me just be clear. I love this actor. She's an iconic horror actor. Okay, let me be clear about this. <laughs> but it struck in my head, and I laughed when it happened. The great PJ Souls, who mm-hmm. is great in Halloween, and she's done many other roles since then, and she is a beloved member of the horror community. She's very much of that, um, you know, Barbara Crampton, you know, just that era of actors who people just adore. And I adore PJ Souls. So let me be clear about that. But my one testicle moment of this film is after the pig's blood drops on Carrie and the whole crowd is like, what the fuck just happened? And if you rewatch it now, we obviously see through Carrie's eyes, the whole, they're all going to laugh at you because she envisions like even the teacher who's defended her this entire film. She envisions the teacher laughing at her because she just kind of snaps in that moment of the, the cruelty and the evil of that moment. But before Carrie's vision starts, (laughs) Our bald-headed high school student and all the other high school students are standing there. They all look dumbfounded. They all look yeah. like this is a, this is as horrific as we could imagine it being when a bucket of blood falls on our prom queen. But then PJ Soul's character, um, who plays what was her character's name? Uh, what am I thinking about here? Uh, Norma. Norma. Norma just crouches down and points up and just starts bursting out laughing and she has the most animated like full-on like she looks like christopher lloyd in who framed roger rabbit her mouth drops and her jaw opens her eyes go wide and she's like remember me i'm the one who killed your brother eddie uh she goes full animation who framed roger rabbit in that moment i cracked up laughing because she, her eyes get so literally look like she must have done like an eight ball in the back and she's <laughs> wired do you Entirely know what i'm possible. talking about do you know what scene i'm talking yes about? i know <laughs> oh yeah no i had my eyes all over pj souls in this movie she was a bit over the top and i almost wonder you know like you hear about it a lot where it's like other actors trying to upstage the others because yeah. you know there's ones that are clearly shining maybe you know i'd love to see if pj is an open book about this were you trying to kind of upstage the other ones because anytime they kind of cut to her she'd just be like Wee! like she would like she would do something a little extra to yeah. make sure that she was she stood out in the scene that's a very actor thing to do it happens all the time like actors will full-blown start saying the other actor's line hoping the director goes you know what? let's give it to that person instead it's a thing actors do um, and I wonder if she was at that stage in her career. She was like, ah, there's a bunch of very good looking and talented women that are like outshining me right now. And I think I need to do my thing to like get in front somehow. Yeah, just- I, I'm just, I'm speculating entirely. I don't know. But every time they cut to her, she was doing something wacky or weird. She seemed to be a little, a little odd. But that scene in particular, when the whole yeah. crowd is just dumbfounded and she just b- busts out laughing, and I was just like, it's just like the look on her face was so animated. It just cracked me up and it caught my attention. So I was glad you put in the one testicle award because that actually, oh, yeah. that flagged in my head before we even had that category named. Um, <laughs> Next up, let's talk about best line. And just to give a little spoiler here, uh, again, you know, we always say Patrick and I don't discuss this before the show. He sends me his list and I make my own list and we kind of surprise each other on the show. Um, This time, 
through no fault of our own, we both picked the best line from basically the same scene. His is earlier, mine is later. So set it up, and I'll let you do your line, and then I'll just quickly tell mine, and then we'll play my line. But they are both from the same scene, which makes sense because it's a great scene in this film. Yeah, it's a fantastic scene, and it's um, it's Mrs. Collins punishing the gang of girls who who bullied, who terribly bullied Sissy Spacex Carey, and um. You know, the, again, it's it's sort of a snap, uh, a snapshot of back in time. There was a time when when uh, teachers could paddle kids, and I I think that went in. I think that went almost into the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. Oh no, it didn't. Yeah, we, there were definitely kids in my yeah. school who got paddled in the late 80s. So. Yeah, so so I think you know the way teachers could interact with students has changed dramatically and for the better in the in the last 20 years or so. Um, and so this was an interesting snapshot of uh, an unruly kid and Miss Collins firing back the way every teacher wants to fire back when a kid is being a purposeful little shit. I just appreciated the way she fired, fired back at her. Yeah. And spit out that gum. Where will I put it, Miss Collins? You can choke on it for all I care. Just get it out of your mouth. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Collins don't give a fuck. You Ms. can choke Collins. on it for all I care. Yeah. Also, going back to my best performance, that Nancy Allen line delivered is exactly like she just sounds like a smarmy little shit in that. Oh movie. yeah. Where would oh, you no. to put it, Miss Collins? Yeah, totally smarmy. You can hear it. You can hear the smarm. Yeah. <laughs> but my my favorite line comes just after that. So she tells all the girls, you know, you're you're basically she goes full on. Uh, she goes full on the teacher from uh, the Breakfast Club. She's like, I got gotcha. you. For two months, Bender, I got you. She's like, for, the, for an hour a day, I got you in my class, and you're going to work your little asses off to pay back what you did to Carrie. And so she's running through all these calisthenics and drills and everything, and finally, Nancy Allen's character is just like, I'm done. I'm not here to get in shape. I'm not here to get worked out by the gym teacher. I'm out of here. And uh, and basically, Miss Collins uh, you know, just gives her what for. So this is from uh, slightly later when, when Chris is – more or less over it and trying to get her friends to join her in and walking out on mrs collins cruelty well there are 10 minutes left stick them up your oh! <laughs> you can't nice you can't for this you bitch what the world and i'm gonna knock you down do you understand me she can't get away with this if we all stick together norma helen so shut up chris just shut up sue is all of us in that moment just shut yeah, up chris. shut the fuck up chris also, jesus i'm certainly not at by the way let me be clear about this patrick you have children mm -hmm. you have a, and you have family members who work in the education system so let me be clear <laughs> when i say this i'm not advocating whatsoever for violence against children let me be clear about that oh sure but Tell me there was not a more satisfying moment in this film than Miss Collins just slapped the shit out of Chris. Everybody loves it. I don't care if they say it out loud or not. Yeah, They all love that scene because everybody wanted to smack Chris. I mean, she what an awful, her. <laughs> what an awful brat she was. Yeah. She was just absolutely. And by the way, again, let me reiterate what she did and how she was being punished. were not even remotely equal. The slap was like not even close to yeah. being uh, like, like, like she was an awful, awful kid. <laughs> yeah. But when, when Sue finally just, she's like, shut up, Chris. Shut yeah. up, Chris. <laughs> like, yeah, we, we were all tired of you in that moment. <laughs> yeah. But that was, that was the definition of an entitled brat. And, and she got what she deserved in that moment. Cause again, I'm not advocating for violence against <laughs> children, but every now and again, if you get a Chris, a little slap <laughs> against the mouth may not be the worst idea. <laughs> just saying, so. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about best kill because, uh, when things go ape shit in this movie, they really go ape shit in this movie. Uh, especially in that gymnasium after that, after that, uh, after that pig's blood falls. And also I did want to give credit again. I meant to do this earlier. I want to throw it out there. Um, this entire film has a great score. Uh, and the score yes. is by, uh, by a guy where, where am I looking at here? What's the guy's name? uh pino where's it at where's the name why am i not getting the music pino dinaggio uh does the film does the score for this film really excellent score i just want to mention that because the score in this film is brilliant and by uh, the way in this movie you will hear 
exactly the the stabbing strings from Psycho. They are this. It is. It's not like trying to sound like it. It's literally the ones from Psycho, and they use it in this movie. Yeah. So there are, but when things really go haywire, things really go haywire in that gymnasium. So Patrick, from that point on, we do get a lot of kills. So what is your best kill for uh, for Carrie? Yeah, Carrie decides to finally go Carrie, um, which every girl named Carrie after that was like, great. Thanks a fucking lot. I'm a, <laughs> we labeled it, this a psychopathic telekinetic. Um, so my favorite kill, really, it wasn't like the most fantastical kill or anything, but it was it was uh, Chris and Billy. Now, Chris and Billy, played by Travolta and, um, oh, God. Now Nancy I'm, Allen. Nancy Allen, thank you. Um, they, they get away with spilling the blood on her and getting out of the – uh, prom not even getting in trouble like they they and i was like oh wait I, I can't remember like how do they die because they're getting away from from carrie uh and, and from from the wrath of all this they're not going to get in in trouble well you know n- moments later after the havoc of the prom uh carrie is is walking down the street heading back towards her house and here comes chris and billy again they can't fucking leave well enough alone, can they? And they want to run her down. And Carrie decides to uh, basically flip their car over and blow them up. And it was just very satisfying to see those two come to an end because they were absolute wretches. They were just it, they were just insufferable in this movie. And it was it was very satisfying to see them go. It's funny you say that because we were watching it last night. And as I said, I've seen this film numerous times, even though I haven't seen it in many years. But my girlfriend had never seen it. And so even in that moment, she's just like, hold on now, Chris and Billy are getting away? Like, this is some bullshit. Like, they actually got out of there. And I was like, hold on, hold on. And then the car just explodes. And I was like, see, they got they got a little extra there. They got what they had, they got what they had coming to them. Yeah. Um, that was definitely the best. But you know what? You know, honestly, this is a weird one to say, that when I say best kill, because I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch a little bit and say most disturbing kill. Because while Margaret White stabbing her own daughter is ultra disturbing and and just a super dark moment and where it goes from there with Carrie bringing the house down around them is creepy and and disturbing and and very violent in that moment. But honestly, I know it sounds like weird I'm going to say this. Not necessarily best kill, most disturbing kill is when all the kids go into the freaking pig farm and just hammer, sledgehammer a pig to death. Yeah, that was. That's some really dark, like... Maybe again, this is the of the time, nineteen seventy six. Like no one would have considered that cruelty, but like they're just like moving a pig around and sledgehammering the poor thing to death. I was like, that is really like evil. Like that yeah. is just inherently cruel. I've used that word a lot in this podcast, but that was like dark to me. Like I have a real issue with animal abuse, and and you see in a lot of films of that era there is animal abuse like they killed dogs left and right in films in the 70s and 80s and you look back now and you're like man that's really dark because yeah. you not dare do that you know in most films in 2023 um because dog owners would be like fuck you uh, <laughs> myself included by the way as a dog owner um but that scene i was just like man that was so dark like them just like picking a pig to just murder with a sledgehammer yeah, I'd forgotten how they how they procured their uh, their pig's blood, and I was like, "Oh, that's fucked up." Yeah, that I'm was definitely glad most- they died in a fiery crash. All right, so next category we've talked about. There's a lot of really mean people in this film, mm-hmm. so we're gonna grade it now and talk about who's the worst because there's a, there's a lot of people who are bad in this film, and you can argue at the end you know carrie snapping and killing everyone is bad although in that moment i was kind of rooting for carrie yeah um as a kid who did get bullied as a kid i was kind of like go carrie (laughs) but who is the worst in this film patrick who is the worst so it would be easy to say chris and chris certainly did irritate me the most in this movie but the ambiguity of sue is what got me and I don't know if it was intentional or not. I couldn't, it was really hard to tell if, if they just ran out of time telling the story, but Sue's, Sue's path. And Sue is the first girl to realize like, ah, we went too far. Like we did what we did to Carrie was cruel. And she comes up with this scheme and the scheme is to make up for it. I'll have my boyfriend who's the star football player and you know, Mr. America himself. I, I will have him take her to the prom well-intentioned but foolish and ultimately led to everyone's demise and so i give it to sue as the worst 
even if she, because I think what she should have done if I if and I wouldn't rewrite this movie so it's not a rewrite of the living dead but I think if I was in Sue's shoes I would try to befriend Carrie personally instead of like tricking her into going to the prom with my boyfriend because what what Carrie needed was an ally Carrie needed somebody to kind of to to kind of you know help her and protect her and she had already stood stood up to Chris who had already told Chris to fuck off basically well now she's got like kind of a coalition of like we all hate Chris and think Chris sucks because she does so see be like hey you know what I'm really sorry for what I did and I think you know like I'd like to try to be your friend if you if you'd have me and instead she creates a the perfect scenario for Chris to pounce on Carrie and uh and so weirdly in this weird back back you know backwards way I gotta say Sue's the worst see I was waiting for this category because I knew you were gonna say Sue and when I got your I honestly swear to God when you sent me the message and you said here's the categories for Carrie I almost emailed you back and I was like did you get the characters mixed up because how is Sue the worst (laughs) um I disagree with you on that character in terms of like, I think she genuinely was trying to do something nice. And I think while I agree in in theory that what Carrie really needed was a friend and not like a date. um, I think that was her, that was her way of including her. That was her way of like including her, making her feel like part of the larger group by having her go to the prom with the star quarterback and to his credit, Tommy ended up being a pretty good dude. Like he actually was yeah. really nice to her and danced with her and even kissed her. Uh, you know, the, and her and his friends, the little group he had with him, like he had another girl with her. Like they were all very friendly and nice to Carrie. And like he was very much like not the typical like jock asshole you see in a lot. Yeah, of Tommy was being there. a good guy. Tommy was being like a legitimately good dude. And so like that to me is what because I agree. If Tommy had been a shit too, and like he was just getting forced into this because of his girlfriend, and he was kind of like begrudgingly taking Carrie to the prom, I would I would one hundred percent agree with you. But because Tommy ended up being a good dude and actually was like being really nice and genuinely caring for Carrie, I don't put Sue in that role. While while her best of intentions did did not work out, but it didn't work out because Chris couldn't let go of her grudge even though her grudge was completely not justified. You know, yeah. She was cruel to Carrie, so she decided to get back at Carrie again because they got punished for something bad they did. And then Chris just continues to escalate it worse and worse. Um, I don't put that on Sue because uh, that is just Chris being evil. That is Chris being genuinely hateful uh, towards a, a person that doesn't deserve it. So I disagree with you on Sue's actions because I genuinely think she was just trying to be nice and do something to make her feel part of the larger group and going to prom is a great, I mean, she sacrificed her own prom. Like she didn't have a date. She didn't go to prom. Like it wasn't like, I'm going to let my boyfriend take you, but I'm going to be there too. She was just like, go have a good time. And like, you know, like go do your thing. But Uh, don't you think the movie was a little ambiguous about her intentions? No, I I didn't. Maybe, maybe, maybe I just, maybe I wasn't looking that deep and I should have, but I I don't think she was. I think she was genuinely like she, because even in that moment, because you remember in the film at the very beginning, when Mrs. Collins, Miss Collins stops the girls from doing it, she makes a special point to be like, Sue, what are you doing? Because she isn't that kind of person. Yeah. He's like, why are you doing this, Sue? And like Sue stops and like realizes what she's done. In my opinion, I think Sue needed like five more minutes in the movie and that you could spread that out. You you can spread that five minutes out over the entire movie, yeah. five more minutes with that character to make that clear. Cause it often felt like when we would cut to Sue that she was scheming and, and, and she never even spells it out. She never even spells out why she's doing it. She's just doing it. And you feel like it's the perfect tee up for Chris. What, and it's clear that her and Chris are not, you know, in cahoots. It's just like, why are you teeing this up so well for Chris? Don't you know what Chris is up to? You talked earlier about like, you know, words getting around, like wouldn't word have got around what Chris was doing? You know, it's, it's a minor, it's a minor complaint, but it's just one of those things where it's like, I think five more minutes of Sue would have, would have made that more impactful, I think in the end. 
I just think when you see like the scene where Mrs. was Miss Collins pulls aside Sue or pulls aside Sue and Tommy and kind of interrogates them a little bit about right, I remember that. Yeah, that is the that to me is the scene where we see it's like with the best of intentions. Of course, it goes horribly wrong uh, because Chris is you know an asshole. Uh, but yeah, I think I think I think Sue is like I think she legitimately felt guilty, and that was her way to make it up to Carrie to be like, here, be part of the group, and you can even go with the guy that we all. Know you have a crush on you know you you liked his poem in in our class and because even in that moment like we saw um when when the teacher was trying to get the kids to criticize his poem and carrie says it was beautiful and they all kind of chuckle and then the teacher kind of mocks carrie and tommy under his breath goes you know you suck or whatever he said about the teacher like yeah you know, basically like saying you're an asshole too you know, like we kind of learned- oh, Tom, yeah, Tommy was great all on his own, saying, but I don't, I but it wasn't any, but, but Sue didn't I, have anything to do with Tommy. But, I, but I'm saying, but I think that's, I think that speaks to the larger essence of who Sue was. Cause like, just like when she lashed out at Chris at gym class and she's like, shut up, Chris. Right. And she just like, she's over it and she realizes how bad it was. Cause she's not that person, but you know, peer pressure and of the moment she mm-hmm. went in with the rest of the crowd. So I think that was really, I, I don't disagree. You could have made it a little less, but I didn't, I personally didn't find it ambiguous. I knew Sue was not in, because when you see her in that prom moment, when she were like, she's there to see like the crowning moment. She wants to like see Carrie finally be accepted. Right. And she sees that rope and she looks up. And also she's the one who goes after and tries to stop uh, Sue and, and Billy, but Mrs. Collins pulls her back thinking she like Mrs. Collins thought what you thought. Right. She yeah. Thought Sue was trying to put her, was trying to pull the rug out from under Carrie when in reality, Sue was trying to stop Billy and, and yeah. Chris from pulling it off. Yeah. And I think, I think like I'm kind of with Miss Collins, like even when they were having that discussion, it's still, even in the discussion that she was having with Sue and Tommy, it was like, is this kid fucking with me? It's really hard to tell what they did a great job of in the movie. And I I guess this is what I was saying about the extra five minutes. You get the extra five minutes with Tommy in the movie to understand that, Oh, even though he's doing this as a favor to his girlfriend, like he's good. He's a good guy. Like you're you, all the evidence is there to go. Tommy's actually a good guy. All the evidence isn't there to show Sue is good. They, and it's weird because everything you're saying is right. But from the perspective of the characters, Sue still looks guilty. Like it, from all the characters looking around, they go, how is Sue not part of what what uh, what Chris and Billy are up to? It, it's it's really weird how it is. And like, and I, and I know exactly kind of, what you're saying. And I think that's also part of what when you see Miss Collins pull her back and then obviously uh, with the, 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 you know, the, the, the gym falling down around them and the fire and everything, like I think at that point, even Carrie's thinking that like, I oh, yeah. up. You know what I mean? So you're not you're not alone in that. I just personally think it was I looked at it from Sue's perspective where she when she tried to stop that she saw them under the under the Yes, in that moment it's clear. She tried to stop them and Mrs. and, and you're, you know you're and so I'm seeing it through Chris's eyes, you're seeing it through Miss Collins' eyes where Miss Collins is like get out of here. Like you're doing something bad and really she was yeah. trying to stop what actually bad happened. Um but you're not you're not wrong. I just I disagreed with like I thought they did a fairly good job of separating her from that character because in that moment when that happened when miss collins grabs her I'm like miss collins what are you doing like yeah. she's actually trying <laughs> to help carrie and you're messing it up that's so, part of the brilliance of it too the tragedy of it all because that's yeah. tragic yeah. it's like this girl that was trying to witness like carrie having a moment gets gets stifled and 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 create creates a shock wave of 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 this all this shit going down um if she if miss collins had done that she'd have stopped billy and carrie wouldn't have killed everybody so yeah. yeah it's it's a tragedy and that's and to me that's what makes this movie brilliant is that on on a deeper level it's not just a slasher it's not they don't even really get into carrie's telekinesis or anything like that it's just tragic it's this girl's powers emerge at the very worst time in her life yeah so for me, who's the worst? I mean, again, you mentioned it. Like the easy answer is Chris because she's the really like villainous character. But I had to go with Mrs. White. I mean, Margaret White is just so unhinged. And listen, I've said on this show before, and I'll say it again now, Patrick. I always preface whenever I talk about religious people, whenever we have religious conversations on this show, two things I like to say. One, 
I'm an atheist. I'm not putting my. I'm not doing it to 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 um right uh, to 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 vilify anybody. I'm not saying that in a way to like, oh, you have to judge. Me. I'm not judging anybody. Just putting it out there. But two, I grew up much like you did around a lot of religion. My family very very religious. Very we're Baptist, hardcore Baptist family. Um, so I understand it very very well. I think even the most religious people who are listeners of this show or who watch movies would, would, you know, it's like dealing with like the Westboro Baptist church, like the really, like no normal faithful Christian Muslim, whatever your religion is, no one would look at them and say, that's the people we want to associate with. It's the other way. You're like, we do not have anything to do with that. We don't act like that. That is not us. That is not us. Like the Westboro Baptist Church, that is not us. That's not what we believe in. That's Margaret White in this movie. Yeah. Like she has gone so like even the most faithful churchgoer would say that woman is off her rocker. Like she's gone way over the overboard in terms of her zealotry and her belief system and her, you know, her own guilt over her own quote unquote sin that she committed. Um she is just wicked and evil and and one of the most diabolical characters i can remember in film history just so over the top with with her beliefs and then putting it upon her daughter and then that that final 10 minutes where carrie comes home and takes a bath and then she finds her mom and she just wants comfort she wants comfort in that moment her mother said they're all going to laugh at you and in her mind they did and so mm-hmm. she killed everybody, just lashing out. And in that moment, she just wants to be comforted by her mother, who in that moment carries like, you were right. You were right, mama. And then yeah. she stabs her with the butcher knife, and you're just like, holy shit, this woman is gone. And then obviously Carrie brings the whole house down around them, and so, you know, that that's the end of it. And also, by the way, I also want to mention this. The closet scene's also ultra disturbing where she chucks her daughter into the closet. Oh, God. And forces her to stay in there. But then she pulls her mother into the closet at the end, and that's where they perish together. Very yeah. dark. But, man, Margaret White is just the worst of the worst. The, you know the big thing about, the, the to me, what makes her villainous over all of those things is that she can't just love her kid. Yeah. Like that I is she, I don't think she loves her kid. I don't think No, she, that's what I'm oh. saying. She can't. That's what I mean. Like that's the villainy. Because all the other things I could argue I go I go there's even evidence in this movie that she kind of knows what Carrie's capable uh, capable of and that when her period comes to her like it clearly unleashes these powers. That's the first time that as far as we can tell that Carrie gets these powers. So her mother's almost like uh, we just talked a little bit about consecration. Uh, this movie uh, where it's like the parents knew and, and these nuns knew that this woman possessed something. And I was like, there's even an argument here that Margaret knows Carrie has something in her and probably needs to kill her because it's been unleashed. And there are multiple times in the movie where Carrie uses her powers against her mom because her mom's been torturing her whole goddamn life because she she can't seem to love her own child so finally when carrie has these powers she goes i I can i can do what i want with you now and margaret now realizes like oh i'm in complete danger like now it's now it's too far and i'm i have to kill this girl because she's a she's a threat um so in a weird i wouldn't justify what margaret's doing but in a weird way i see like where her logic was rolling the the villainy the true villainy to me is her being unable to love her own kid like despite what happened in her life and how she came about even having carrie she could have she could have embraced her child and loved her child and maybe her child wouldn't have been maybe you know maybe would have used those powers in a good way as opposed to a bad way um so that's why she is the true villain because she just didn't know how to love her child which was the that's that's the most vile part of the movie it's like that's your kid yeah and she definitely did not love her child. Her child was her child was an extension of her sin, and so that's how she treated her. Yeah, awful. Yeah, just terrible. All right, let's talk about uh, one of our two new categories we've added in recent episodes, uh, and this is the one where we talk about a film and we talk about should we remake it, should we sequelize it, or should we leave it alone? Now, to be fair, there is already a remake of this film starring Julianne Moore and uh, Chloe Grace Moretz that came out. I can't remember what year it came out, but it's uh, 2013 or something. Pretty good cast, actually, in it. Um, yeah. Crazy how good of a cast it has in it, but uh, it is a remake. So there is a remake. 
we also talked about could they do a sequel and then leave it alone. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to go first in this category, and I'm just going to slam the door right now and say, leave it the fuck alone. <laughs> um, sorry, I've seen the Chloe Grace Moretz version, and I, I think she's a great actor, and I, obviously Julianne Moore is amazing. Um, that film is not good. It's not a good representation of, of Carrie. I just I didn't like it. And, and again, yes, I'm 100% comparing it to this film, and mm-hmm. it just fails in so many ways to, to, to compare itself to the 1976 original um this film is brilliant from start to finish patrick from the opening scene which is uh, utterly disturbing to the dream sequence at the closing where sue has a nightmare that she goes to the house and you see the sign says carrie white burns in hell and the hand jumps out out of the ground and grabs sue and scares the hell out of her a scene that reminded me very very much of the ending scene of of friday the 13th the original where jason pops out of the water in a dream sequence in that film um and little known fact that actually is sissy spacek's arm she insisted on that being her arm bursting through the ground so they had to build a whole like underground box and basically bury her in the ground so her hand could pop up and grab sue's hand um this is this is a perfect film, Pat. This is this is about as close to a perfect film as you can get. So leave it alone. Don't sequelize it. Don't remake it again. Leave it alone. Have you seen the sequel? There's an actual sequel. There is an actual sequel, yes. And no, I don't ever I saw it in the theater. You did. <laughs> I did. So I I've saw it in the, the theater. I've seen the remake. I've not seen the sequel. I've seen the sequel. The sequel is just just laughably forgettable. Um, but it, it, like I will say this, I I think I've only seen smatterings of the remake. The 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 sequel um, not only has Sue in it, Sue's actually a character in it, um, but it, it's it's like really faithful to the storyline. It's just it's just set in like the late '90s, which imagine how great that looks. It doesn't. Um, so yeah, it, it, listen, you're right. Just leave it alone. It's it's as good as it gets. Like it's as good as it gets. Um, you know, would I change a few things? Maybe I, I don't consider it perfect, perfect, but it's like, it's, com- it's a very compelling movie that I don't, that I don't need any reinterpretation of. Yeah. I don't need another one. <laughs> Just don't. Yeah, no, no, leave it, leave it alone. Uh, all right. What about next category is, could we survive this horror film? And this is where we kind of inject ourselves into whatever film we're reviewing. And we basically say, could you and I survive this film? So Patrick, when it comes to Carrie, would you and I survive that gym massacre? Would you and I, would one of us be Billy? Please tell me you're not Billy. Uh, <laughs> hey, Damon, up your nose with a rubber hose. Yeah. Would we survive this horror film, Patrick? What do you say? I mean, I'd love to believe I would because I know I'd be nice to carry. I was the kind of kid in high school. Um, I was not perfect. I, I think we were all little shits because we were all going through puberty and and you don't know how to handle yourself. Um, so I wasn't perfect. But I, I was friends with everybody and I didn't like bullying and I wasn't I wasn't cool with bullying at all. Um, so I think I would have been in Carrie's good graces, but it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, if I would have been at prom for sure. And I would have got massacred just like everybody else, because you get trapped in there. You, I'd either gotten burned or killed or stopped by some. I, you can't survive what what was going to go down that day. Yeah. It's hard to say for that because I'm in the same boat. I got bullied in school, so I know what Carrie went through. Certainly not to that extreme, thankfully, but I did get bullied in school. So I certainly wouldn't have been one of the people bullying her. I would have 100% stood up and been one of the kids who would have, you know, defended Carrie in that moment. But as you said, it doesn't really matter. Now, here's where I say I have a small chance of survival, Patrick. Okay. I didn't, I went to my senior prom. I did. I went to my senior prom. I went for about an hour and then I left and all my friends, we went out and got drunk and ended up hanging out at someone's house and doing nefarious things that children of 17 years old are tend to do. So my <laughs> only, my only, my only reprieve of survival is, is that I don't know that I would have stuck around for the actual coronation of the king or queen. I feel like maybe I would have just been like, I'm out of here. This is boring. I'm done. Uh, in that regard, I maybe could have survived because I wouldn't have been there for the gym massacre. Otherwise, as nice as I feel I would have been to Carrie, as accepting as I would have been, and even to a certain point, I probably would have defended Carrie, I'm still going down like everybody else because I'm trapped in those doors, and I'm a big dude, man. I ain't running for it, so I'm <laughs> fucked. Uh, so yeah, so in that regard, no, but, if I, but just to play devil's advocate, 
I did peace out early on my own prom, so maybe by the time they got to the coronation, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not interested. And I would have left, been out in the parking lot, starting my uh, dad's Buick LeSabre, and then <laughs> see the whole place go up in flames. In that <laughs> moment, I may have survived. You, you're bringing up an interesting point because I'm thinking, I, A, I, don't, I have no idea who were king and queen of the prom because I'm pretty sure, I don't want to get into the details, <laughs> but I know I wasn't on the dance floor. I was somewhere else for sure. <laughs> Um, somewhere else, and I, I I remember what I was doing. Um, so maybe I wasn't there. Yeah. So it's possible, Damon, that I would survive just just on the fact that I didn't care to stay for the king and queen of the prom. Maybe I, I'm I, it's fuzzy, but I don't remember the end of the prom. I just remember doing other things that were not prom related necessarily. <laughs> Yeah, I know I, I know I was not in the room when that happened in my prom. I know we were there for like an hour and we all left. So, again, just playing devil's advocate, there is a chance I wouldn't have been around for that to happen, and so there's a chance I survived. But Yeah, there's a chance. Yeah. If I'm in the if I'm in the gymnasium, you know, nice or not, I'm screwed. So Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I, but I, again, I, I think it would have been okay otherwise, because I think I would have got out of there. I think I would have been there for about an hour and be like, Yeah, that's pretty lame. I'm gonna get out of here. <laughs> uh last category is always patrick which is is it scary uh this is an iconic film carrie of course going back to 1976 but we we have to judge on a scale of course because what's sure. scary in 1976 not necessarily scary in 2023 but patrick at the end of the day carrie is it scary uh carrie is scary actually um and it's not for the reasons you might think um what what on this latest view i think what was different for me was how much time you spend with the bullies in this movie. It's almost the bullies movie. Almost. Yeah. I would say it's like 60, 40, the bullies. Like you pay more time to them and, and, and you could, you, you could lump Sue in with the bullies if you wanted to, like I would. Um, it, it really spends more time with them than I, than I ever thought, than I ever thought of when I think of this movie. Uh, and the time that you spend with Carrie is is just is is woefully tragic, but that that spending all that time with the bullies is it's, it's very it's a very sinister thing. It feels very sinister. It feels very like nasty and and just it it, it it makes you it leaves you feeling dirty, you know, having to just be with these awful shits all the time, and you're just like ugh, like something. That's to me that's where the dread in this movie comes from. You know, like the real chaos and mayhem of the prom is really just the end of the movie that's pretty much the final 20 minutes of the movie everything before that the 70 minutes before that is pretty much just kids doing kid stuff uh high school stuff getting ready for prom and so uh in a movie like prom night that made for a less scary movie because it's basically the same formula minus the uh minus the telekinesis um, but that movie, I was like, man, this movie's kind of boring because it's just about kids getting ready for prom. Whereas this movie, Carrie, it's about bullies getting ready to do something awful to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Yeah. And that's fucked up. Yeah. And that just leaves you feeling dark. And so that it, it gets my scary for that reason. I will disagree with you on prom night. I love prom night, but I do agree with you on this film. This film is not traditional and scary outside of, I would say the, the, the hand popping up in the dream sequence is a good jump scare. I guarantee you in 1976, I mean, oh, yeah. jump out of their theater seat. Cause you don't see that coming. You just see the dream sequence and the Carrie white burns in hell. And then you don't expect her arm to pop up and grab Sue. Um, but I would say it is a scary movie because it's disturbing. I mean, it's uncomfortable. The scenes with Carrie and her mother are really uncomfortable. The scenes with Carrie, the, obviously the opening scene in the bathroom is incredibly uncomfortable. And then even in that moment where Carrie finally loses it and starts killing people, like you kind of feel terrified in that moment because she has her own vision of seeing Miss Collins and everybody laughing at her, even though they're not actually laughing at her. She just sees it in her own, mind, in her own mind's eyes. They're laughing at her. And that's disturbing to see it all unfold like that. And you feel kind of bad. You feel like what a tragic situation. Um, it is. It's filled with dread. It's dripping with dread um, and dripping with just disturbing, creepy imagery. And I think that in and of itself makes for a scary movie. Yeah, it does. This is, I mean, it's a classic for a reason, folks. There's, it's, a, we, we are just deciding what's great. There's a reason people can't stop talking about Carrie. It's, it's a very, very, very special horror film.
Yeah, we're going to have to, I think next week on the show, we're going to review Boogeyman, the Boogeyman, which comes out in theaters. So that's going to be our next show. Uh, We want to do another Stephen King one. I think next week when we do this, we're going to have to do our favorite Stephen King adaptations, our top five. I'm not sure if we've done that before. We may have. Uh, Yeah, Uh, I don't know. But we'll do our top five Stephen King adaptations next week, uh, whether film or TV, which ones we like the best. Um, obviously I think Carrie's going to be on that list cause it's just iconic. And when you, when you combine a great Stephen King story with Brian De Palma, who again is one of my favorite directors, you get a great example of what you can do with filmmaking. And this was a film that stands the test of time. It's still great today. Um, obviously want to say a big thank you as always to everyone that tunes into the show. We do appreciate it. Make sure you check us out on all of your favorite podcast platforms, Apple podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon music, Google podcasts. And of course you can also find us over on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel. Now just search rewind of the living dead on YouTube. You'll find us over there. Please subscribe. We're trying to build that channel up. Uh, you know, we were late arrivers to that, but we are there now. So go over to YouTube and check us out on there as well and subscribe and listen or watch the show. If you want, you can see our beautiful faces on the, uh, on the YouTube broadcast. Uh, and you can also find the podcast over on my website, nerdcore movement, Dot com. If you got questions, comments, movies you'd like us to review, or you just want to say burn in hell, Carrie White, uh, send us emails at rotlivingdead at gmail.com. That's rot livingdead at gmail.com or find us on social media we are everywhere we are on instagram we are on twitter and we are on facebook once again just search rewind of the living dead or you can always hit us up on our own personal uh social media channels i am at damon martin and you are at director patrick a big thank you as always for everyone tuning into the show next week is the boogeyman so stay tuned for that we'll see you next week on another edition of rewind of the living dead thanks for tuning in We'll see you then. Peace.